think we have to open it up to these guys out here. Uh, wait till you get a mic. There are two people with mics on either side. this before this was a this I've said this before this is my responsibility as an actor to do this was not an eccentric affected choice of oh I think it'd be cool if I did um, it was something I, I needed to do and uh, yeah the right the right role it was definitely part of the wonderful adventure that I had um, in the middle here again lots of hands hi um you talked about, well, how do you get into the headspace of someone in, in a true story and a really heavy subject matter, and then be able to go home and let that be and, okay. and wrap at the end of the day? It seems very, very difficult. Um, you know, I, I mean, this being somewhat biographical, I had so much to digest. I mean, I had 16 hours of tapes, transcripts, I had his family open their scrapbooks to me, I had his diary, I had so much plenty to do, those things that us actors go, wow, look at all this, and I'm going to dive into this, and I'm going to have so much fun creating backstories, things that I was getting from his diary, and then you start reading between the lines, you know, I mean, I remember, you could, I could hear what he said on his tapes. And after the first couple of times, I listened to what he was literally saying, and then I had to remember this was a guy talking to a guy who was going to write his story. Now, we, so he was already soliciting, whether he knew it or not. And he was a salesman, but you go, okay, what are the things in between? You know, and I remember hearing certain speech patterns sneak up, where he'd be sound like a complete, this guy, seventh grade education, who became this expert. And, uh, he would speak like a medical scientist and expert, and then slip off the same sentence into a conspiracy theory, come back, tell a joke, and forget what the fuck he was talking about, and the dementia was coming in. And so he, it was all right angles. This was not merge and, 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 and easy. There, there were rough corners with, with this guy. All of them were rough. Um, his diary up to this book gave me the monologue. That was my secret. I had that in my hip pocket. And that, there's a lot to read between the lines. I mean, uh, everything from what his dreams and aspirations were, wandering, wandering, trying to just maybe get out of there, figure out what he could do with his life. Uh, and that would fade out every week. Till Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the, the, the long hand would get a little more. You could tell he was high up late at night, scribbling, doodling, you know, um, talked about people he hooked up with. and. The guy lived in a small town trying to get out. This was before he had HIV. Um, so I just, I had, I had all that. There were certain places I went where, you know, imagination served. I would try to give four or five versions of each scene because I knew we weren't going to have time on the day to talk about them. I knew we weren't going to have time to say, well, hey, what if we tried this? Just went in and tried to go as loaded as possible. Um, and have enough to where I felt like I could go run, keep running the camera, don't even need, don't even you cut. Um, but the coming home, I mean, I don't, I didn't come home, I don't think I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an actor who, I don't know, that, that word method, I don't, it's kind of misused, it's got so many definitions, people throw it around in an odd way. I mean, when I, I so I was, I was, I say I was, so seeing this guy from the inside out that I was never objective or never a voyeur on what was happening. But at the same time, I know I was talking to Jean Marc about the scenes continually. Now I was talking to him in my understanding of the scene, but I was talking to him as Ron Woodruff would talk to him. Now that number one was relaxing because Ron gets to the point real quick. <laughs> he doesn't miss yeah. words. And so our communication was hardcore and it had nothing to do with, you know, one of manners and graces. Um, which at least made it, our, our communication clear. But coming home, um, 
kids. No. Like, well, with kids, that's a that's a, I mean that's sort of sort of a a free wonderful kick in the heart. They just remind you, hey, you're playing make believe, so make them believe. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you're coming home, and I'm a big like, logic guy, and kids quickly remind you, logic doesn't have anything to do with this. <laughs> There's not a period on the end of any of these stories. Mm -hmm. You said the end? No. I said the cheetah grew wings and flew over the purple sea and landed on top of the elephant. If you say you can't do that, well, I'm saying the cheetah ran west and ran around the world until it came up on the other side with the elephant. You're like, that could happen. <laughs> so, there's a certain relaxation to that, and it's a nice, for me, it's a nice reset at the end of the day. Um, I mean, I know I definitely change somewhat in my own character with each role I'm playing now in my, in my own life, but, uh, you know, I don't come. It's, it's, a nice, it's, it's nice to have. I like having that one checkout at the end of the day. I don't like in the middle of the day, an hour between setups, go back to the trip. I do not like that. I don't like going back and introducing myself to the real world, hearing a phone ring, hey, can you make this phone call in between? I don't like that on the day. I like go to work in the morning, 12 hours later let someone tell you, okay, it's a wrap, and then kind of have a glass of wine fade out and head back home and see the family, but, yeah. Okay, let's have a mic down here. Two people actually right next to three people next to you. So just pass it down. Um, Matthew, I, I just wanted to, to acknowledge to you that this is the most authentic portrait of a person with AIDS that I've seen in the film. I know that world really well. I know PWAs that I love that were assholes. I know PWAs that were straight that were assholes, but I love them because of their humanity. So I want to congratulate you and the, and the script. I mean, I thought the integrity of the script was just wonderful. My question has to do with working with Lee Daniels and working with John Pierre. The kind of courage that you brought to each of those characters in The Paperboy and in this film, where do you go to go, oh, I'm going to push myself there in a very dangerous zone for someone who may not be like the character? Well, when I said get drunk on their obsessions earlier, yeah. look, I think one of the things, you know, like there's a scene in Lee Daniels' Paperboy where Ward gets beat, you come and see him bloody and beat the two black guys. Well, you know, I, it was, Ward was a guy with all about secrets, right? So I was, figured he was really into those S&M clubs down in Miami, and that's a place he went because he could get away with it mm -hmm. and not be exposed. And so this night in that film, he goes back down that dark road. And I remember the idea was, Lee was like, okay, so I think you'd be, you know, laying there and you're, and you're, and you're, uh, you know, you're, you're probably handcuffed in front. And you're laying there bloody. And I was like, no, hands are handcuffed to the ankles. And it's been bent over like he's took it the worst way. And it was ugly. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 think about this guy. He liked, he liked it. Mm -hmm. He needed that pain. Mm -hmm. He needed that pain. And I remember Lee going, you are not. You are not. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then we were like, so, you know, that was in context with who the guy was. I'm not ever trying to push something for eccentricity's sake. Mm -hmm. I've done that before, and I've seen it done before. And you're like, well, that was eccentricity for eccentricity's sake. To what? Get shock value? And mind you, I know that that character in that role, and me even playing that character in that role, had something to do with the shock value mm -hmm. of the whole story mm -hmm. and the fact that it was me playing it. There's a certain, for some people, a certain shock value. But, I mean... It didn't feel like something that I was like, this is a really creative thing. It seemed like that's the truth of what the guy would do. And if I'm, while I'm there on the set, working, I'm not thinking about my outside world perceptions of me, Matthew, McConaughey. I, that, that's one of the fun, great things about this travel we get to do when we go act. You get to go there and be in that bubble and say, just be true to your man here. Tell the truth on this guy. And that's, that's, and so I just, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I, mean I, I always like if I can in context find what certain characters are obsessed with and what their monologue or secrets are. I I enjoy pushing them further to the truth. I think that the truth burns. <laughs> truth, the truth is ugly. Mm -hmm. It ain't easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, and that was a, that was a character, and and then with this one, you know, shoot this guy, he wouldn't have been such a son of a bitch. He wouldn't live the seven years. Mm -hmm. That same guy that you can't stand is the reason he stayed alive seven more years. Mm -hmm. And rage, that's what this guy had so much of. And I've said this before, but it's true, man, no emotion. Rage gets more shit done than any other emotion. Like it or not, for good or for bad, rage gets more done. Causes more movement. And that's what this guy had. That's what kept him alive because he was so damn mad. You know? Okay. Yeah. When, uh, when there's a scene in the movie when Ron was crying in the car. Yeah. And, um, I saw sadness in that cry, but I also saw, like, hope or happiness. I'm not sure, like an uplifted, uplifting emotion. Mm. And was there an uplifting emotion in that cry? And if there was, um, like, how do you manage all those emotions at once? Yeah. Look, for me, with most emotional scenes like that, like, I, I, I personally cry at birth much quicker than I cry at death. I just personally will. I, if I think of something, the guy that was wrongly accused that got out of prison, I'm, I'm weeping. You know, he, he got out. I mean, kids' birth, things like that. That's where I, I lose it. Um, that scene, though, for me was, I didn't see anything in that to see as hopeful. That's Ron at his peak of isolation. He's just gone through, just been told he has it completely. What are you talking about? You're speaking another language. HIV, what? What the fuck did you say? Takes the guy as a challenge to the doctor, which was great. That guy that would do that. I remember thinking, that's how that guy would react. He wants to fight the guy that said, those are fighting words. <laughs> the doctor said, you got HIV. <laughs> and then, denial, and then he figures it out on his own. And so that was, for me, that was just that, that drive was Ron's trip, and all of a sudden it hits him. That's when it first hits him. That his mortality is for real. He's been given 30 days. And what the fuck am I going to do? He looks at the gun, you know, he's got enough rage to not pick that thing up. But he's had a, it, it, was, it was a dead, it's where the reality set in for the first time. And that's it. So I didn't personally have anything in my mind or play anything that felt hopeful um, in that scene. Yeah. No, you, you spoke about finding your characters within yourself or within your, the truth of who the character is. Yeah. Do you ever find the need to go and speak to other people to find the sorts? I mean, you said, because sure. this is a biography, and can you talk about what you look for in the people you interact with, sure. whether it's a lawyer or whether it's an HIV sure. uh, positive? Um, I've done a couple of biographical pieces. So like I said, when I went and talked to Ron's family, sister and daughter, and I, when, I, when I heard those tapes, and I knew here's a guy selling his buyer's club to a guy who's going to make a movie, you've got to go, where's he telling the truth? And what I need to read between the lines about who he really was. Because I'm playing him, it's live. He's, he's just coming into this. He's, he's not, he doesn't have the buyer's club yet in this film. Um, secondly, I went to meet his family. You're going to talk about somebody in your, in your family that's, that's, that's no longer here? It's real easy to give somebody the greatest hits version of who that person was at his best. The things they say at the funeral. His family was so honest about who he was and who he was not. You know, I'm like, he stole my cars twice. They <laughs> 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 got him back. One of them, they just found in New Jersey. <laughs> and then he goes, well, he was a son of a bitch. And they'd always think, but you couldn't help but love him. Um, and then, you know, I've done others where I really tried to I really tried to study the person and emulate them. I've also done them like in Bernie where I didn't want to. My imagination seemed so clear with who the guy was and Rick Linklater, the director, knew him. So I said, I need to go through, I need, you're, you're my meter because I'm not going to go, I'm choosing not to go study this guy because where my imagination is with what you've written on the page, I just don't feel like I want or need anymore. So I said, you tell me if I'm going too much or not enough, and you know, Rick and I work where he always takes me right up to, if it's comedy, usually he'll take me right up to well, before we get to caricature, you know, <laughs> but he's got a great, he and I have a real similar sensibility about that, um, so I trusted Rick um, on, on that. Um, look, there are other people, there are, you know, 
people that, that, that I've talked about that I have, and I'm not going to say their names because I haven't made the movies, but, but their stories are still out there to be made. And I, what you hear, how them talk about themselves on Friday night, <laughs> it's great. Talk to them Sunday night. <laughs> I never spoke like that. I, no, I would never use those words. I never did those things. And you're like, oh, okay, Sunday came. Went to church. <laughs> Thinking about post-mortem. <laughs> you know, how am I going to look? What, what shadow am I leaving? Talk to them next Thursday night. I was wilder than that. I was, I did this and then. So you have to, I have to read between the lines. And usually I think the Friday night version is more true. Who they are. Um... So, they to listen to things. I try to listen to things like that. And that's what I mean when I say read between the lines a little bit. Um, and a lot of times what they're saying when they're not talking, <laughs> or when you catch them when they don't feel like they on that. They don't feel like it's a proverbial Sunday night, and they need to give the best version of themselves. Okay. So someone, yeah, two people way in the back. If we can get mics in the middle, actually there are three people, and I think that's going to have to be it. Way back in the back row. You can probably yell, but I wouldn't hear you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> no? Yes, here, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I want to ask you something, and it's um, in the beginning of your career, how do you deal with um, <laughs> economical struggles or with validating yourself? Especially in this film industry, like um, validating yourself as you are going to make it, you know, like no matter what. Especially like I'm talking about like 20 years ago, uh, like validating yourself as you were going to make it. Like how do you deal with all of those struggles uh, that make some people never make it, even if they're super talented, mm -hmm. or, but others like you that you make it. And when I say you make it, you know, it's because of this big recognition, but because you're able to do what you do right. and what you like to do. Um, well, let me tell you what, what happened for me, and everyone's got a different script about how it worked out for them. I did Days of Confused between my junior and senior year of college. I finished that for the first time. I was like, able, a week into that was when I first said, man, I, I love this. I'm getting paid $320 a day. People are patting me on the back of the day today saying, you're good at this. That's the first time I ever thought about it as a possible career. I knew I wanted to be in the storytelling business, but I wouldn't even allow myself to dream about being an actor. I go back to school, graduate, and drove out west, and I, and I had a, uh, what I thought was a production assistant job. Now, I show up out there with a few thousand dollars in my pocket, and that production assistant job got pushed, the movie got pushed, so I didn't have that job. But the first audition I went on was for a guy named Hank McCann for a film called Boys on the Side. So, while after that audition, the next one, Angels in the Outfit, this is places where I got very fortunate, lucky, however you want to call it. Angels in the Outfit was a Disney baseball film. <laughs> they wanted to see me, all American guy named Ben Williams who played the outfield. I put on my all American cap, went to go see this guy on the Warner Brothers line. I remember I walked in, it was the afternoon, I was backlit by the sun on the Warner Brothers line, the guy was <laughs> on the couch. And I walked in, and he goes, Hey, look at you, the all American kid. I said, Yes, sir. He goes, You ever played baseball? I said, 12 years ago, you got the job. <laughs> <laughs> I was up in Oakland playing baseball for 11 weeks for Schedule F, 48-5. We threw a big party, and I paid. <laughs> and then that Hank McCann thing, I could call back to Reaper Herb Ross and got that part from Boys on the Side. So, the first auditions I had out there,